Hello, I'm Denise Magson, the Marketing Manager at the Northern College of Acupuncture. I'm here at the University of York to talk to Dr Hugh McPherson, who is a Senior Research Fellow here at the Department of Health Sciences. Hugh has been responsible for many of the groundbreaking acupuncture research studies in the UK and I'm very interested to hear all about his career and how he sees the importance of research as central to the development of acupuncture and complementary therapy professions. Uh, hello. hello. Hey, yeah. Nice to see you. Yeah, very good. Welcome to the, to the university. Thank you very much. Research is now a very important part of what you do, but could you tell us a little bit about your journey from practitioner to researcher? Well, it's been a long journey, and uh, I've been a practitioner now for 30 years, and uh, I've been seeing all, you know, in my practice, a whole range of patients, all sorts of different conditions, lots of chronic conditions, lots of chronic pain, for example. And about 15 or 20 years ago, I realized uh, I, wanted, I was interested in research. And when I looked at the evidence in the literature, it didn't reflect the sort of the success rate that I was getting in my clinic. You know, people would generally be getting better in, in the clinical practice. But then you look at the research evidence, and it didn't show the same sort of results. You know, there was lots of un inconclusive studies, in uh, systematic reviews that said we more research needed, we don't know, we can't have a definitive um, conclusion on, on this and on that. So I thought that's very strange. How come my clinical practice looks good and the, the research evidence doesn't match that? So that's, that's what started me on a, a research journey. And then uh, a particular incident occurred where um, uh, the Men's Health magazine had a, a front page, actually it was on the outside cover, it said complementary medicine can kill, which, which I was mightily shocked with because I was thinking, hang on a minute, I've, I, you know, that's not our business. <laughs> um, so, so I went to the, to the men's health, looked at the references, and they quoted a particular study that, that had been published in the literature that, that detailed six people who might, be, who might have been um, killed inadvertently as a result of acupuncture. So I went to the six original studies and checked all of them, and I realized the association between the acupuncture and the death was tenuous. And so what was happening was the, this particular study that, that quoted the six deaths was being used to sort of amplify uh, or scare people in, in a way that just didn't seem appropriate. So wh what I realized was that, that the, 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 the adverse event rate, in other words, the, the safety of acupuncture um, can be measured by the numbers of people who have adverse events divided by the denominator, which is how many incidents, uh, how many uh, consultations there are worldwide per year. You know, you have millions and millions of treatments going on, and you have hardly any adverse events. So when you have the denominator there, you get a, a, a context for how safe acupuncture is. Whereas if you just quote six deaths like that, it doesn't actually tell you very much um, about how safe acupuncture is. So that was extremely annoying to have this, uh, this, I thought, poorly reported study then amplified by the popular press. So that got me started and I went to the British Acupuncture Council and said, we need to do a proper study that includes a denominator. So you will look at the safety as a, as a proportion of the total number of treatments that are given. So we have a, an, a, a relative safety, if you like. And uh, so the British Acupuncture Council funded me uh, around in the late, 1990s to do actually uh, we did two studies we looked one we looked we asked practitioners about safety and then we looked we asked patients because we realized pa if a patient has a bad experience they won't go back to their practitioner possibly so the practitioner might not even know something bad happened so we did a second study where we looked at patient safety and we, we published those papers the first one was in the british medical journal and the second one in another high profile you know, high impact journal and that more than anything settled the debate about how safe acupuncture was in the UK. From then on, it's now it was assumed that acupuncture um, is safe in competent hands. People who are qualified are safe to deliver acupuncture. Can you tell us something about your work here in York? I'm particularly interested to hear about your neuroimaging project. Right, well, just to take the first question about my research here in York. So on the back of the safety study, we then uh, got funding with people from Sheffield, actually, to conduct a back pain trial, looking at acupuncture for back pain. And 
out of that, uh, I got the, um, the back of the various studies I was doing, I got a postdoctoral fellowship here at the University of York to study acupuncture and look at its safety, its, its effectiveness, its um, cost effectiveness, and also there was the opportunity to do some neuroimaging, which I'll come to in a minute. My main work here has been looking at uh, an effect in the clinical effectiveness and cost effectiveness. So we've done some big trials looking at irritable bowel syndrome, looking at depression. We've got a current one looking at chronic neck pain. And, the, and uh, so we're, we're building in all the sort of economic analysis so we can determine whether these, uh, these treatments are value for money or not. And, uh, and also we're doing sub-studies looking at which patients benefit more and other, some practitioners are better than others and so forth. So we've got lots of detailed teasing out of the, of the data that's going on. So that's been my main job here. But when I first came here, uh, they, they just built a brand new neuroimaging center at, at the back of the building here. Six million pounds worth of building and um, scanners and so forth. And they had no projects, which was um, an interesting situation. And then the director, who I had met and, and had a good chat with, said, if you'd like, you could come here and into the scanning um, uh, building do a project with acupuncture looking at neuroimaging and how acupuncture might work. And you can do it for free because we've got no projects at the moment. So this is an amazing opportunity to get all this free scanning time because currently it costs about three or four hundred pounds an hour to be in there. <laughs> so so, so we, we put together a project to, to try and understand what happens when a needle goes in in terms of the processing in the brain. And so if you put a needle in the, in the hand, say, on the right-hand side here, you'd expect some other sensory activity uh, here, that the blood flow will increase, the neuronal activity will increase on the opposite side. But what we found with the acupuncture, more interesting and counterintuitive, was deeper in the brain, where there's an area called the pain matrix in the, the, the limbic area. There's a pain matri matrix, particularly the insula. Again, you'd expect that to be, you know, if you cause pain, yeah. that would be activated the acupuncture deactivated that area, yeah. right? So we had the opposite of what you'd expect. So it seems like the way people process pain can be mediated by acupuncture in some way. And especially that's that response, the, the deactivation is very strong when we were getting the chi sensation. You know, the chi is the chi, that's the ache, the dull ache that acupuncturists try to get at the acupuncture points. When you get the chi, you get a stronger deactivation in, in the, the pain matrix. So, you know, this, this seems to be plausible that there's some, in terms of the, the, the mechanism of acupuncture, this has p a, a part to play. It's probably not the whole story. There are other things that will be happening locally, for example. But in terms of the, s the central processing in the brain, this seems to be an important component. I've been incredibly fortunate that the York's my hometown, and here the local university has been fostering all sorts of work here and supporting it um, at a high level. And, and that's enabled us to do some much more interesting research than otherwise would have been possible. Uh, what is your viewpoint, Hugh, on qualitative versus quantitative research? That's a good question. I think, first of all, you have to think about what you're trying to research and what your research question is, and then what the methods are that are appropriate for the research question. So if your question is, you know, is, does acupuncture have a clinical effect for back pain, uh, which is will re require a randomized control trial to answer that. You know, it's, it, and especially when you're looking at cost effectiveness, and if you want to int int influence policy, like we did with the back pain, actually had an influence on NICE guidance, who quoted our, our trial for here in New York, and that was in, in very influential in terms of NICE recommending back pain. That's because we did a randomized control trial. Whereas, if you want to ask the question, what was the patient experience in that trial? You know, what what was going on for the patient, what did they l appreciate, what was acceptable, what was difficult, what could have been better, for instance. Those sort of questions, you need to use qualitative research. So to, get the, to dig deeper into the patient experience, or the practitioner experience for that matter, you need to use qualitative methods. So there's not a, um, a, a good or a bad here, it's about what your focus is, what your research question is, and what sort of impact you might be trying to have. And all of those factors have an influence on the methods, whether they're qualitative or quantitative. Are there any particular information sources and research databases that you would recommend? Oh, there's, it depends again what sort of research you want to do. The, the main, well, there's a number of resources. The, the British Acupuncture Council has the uh, ARC database, 
um, that's led by Mark Bovey. Uh, on, the, on the web, there's uh, numerous sources, including PubMed, where you can type in and access the abstracts for all the main journals and so forth. Increasingly now, um, open access is becoming important. So lots of, lots of our publications from here in York now are open access, almost all of them of late. So you can get not just the abstract, you can get the whole article online. And uh, because, because the, the, the way you can search now, um, you can access all sorts from the, from the, uh, in the literature much more easily than it was possible a few years ago. And how can the application of research further develop the practitioner's skills? That's a good question. Uh, I would say, first of all, research doesn't suit everybody. But if you have an inquiring mind, and you're curious, and you're interested in understanding acupuncture better, and how it might be practiced better, and how you might have an influence on shaping acupuncture in the future, and you feel like you want to do more than just be working in your practice seeing patients, which certainly was the case in my case, I felt I wanted to do more than just see patients. I was very satisfied seeing patients. I like that, and I still do that one day a week. But I like having another dimension to my work. Research offers that. It's a whole a uh, sweetie shop of opportunities to, 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 and you can start at a lower, lower level than I'm working here at the university. You can look at auditing your, your patients, you can look at the, um, outcomes for different conditions, you can build up slowly, and then the master's is an opportunity to get formal support for that, to have supervision, have some structure, have some specific learning inputs, so you can raise your level, so you can start thinking about the theoretical issues and, the pr and how they might impinge in a practical way if you're doing projects. There's all sorts of possibilities with the structure of, of a master's that would enable you to raise your level. And if it's an electronically based master's, you can do that based at your own home rather than having to travel. So you can take that work at your own pace and study it in depth at home and get the support, though, online with tutors and so forth back at the, the Northern College. Finally, Hugh, I know that you were involved with the introduction of e-learning into the curriculum at the Northern College of Acupuncture. Can you tell me how you're feeling about these new online MSCs for practitioners? Many practitioners work in isolation. Some work in their own homes and they don't work with anyone else. Others work in, in uh, multidisciplinary clinics where there's lots of other practitioners with different traditions. But generally, we don't work in a big institution like the National Health Service in, in the UK or in a hospital where there's there's more structured support. We're m often more on our own to develop ourselves. And I think getting stale as a practitioner would be not very good for you, for your work, your, for the patient experience. So, so doing a master is about, about staying fresh and alive and engaged in your field, about progressing and developing as a person within your field. And uh, developing your practice can, can happen in conjunction with that. And while well, the online provides an opportunity, so. As practitioners, we're often in all sorts of locations around the country or around, around the world, in fact. You can plug into this network, of, of, of the online learning network with the Northern College, based in your own home, and not have to travel, which might be problematic, and, uh, and be part of a cohort or a group of students that you would travel through in a sense, and the course would be your, your journey, traveling with other fellow students from around the world.